Hi, this is the talk on the Aloha Index of Pupillary Activity for CHI 2020. It's work uh, by myself and my friends, Christoph Kreitz, Nina Gerr, Tanya Bafnad, Per Begard. Christoph is in uh, Poland, Nina is in Germany, Tanya and Per are in Denmark. Uh, we have funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation, for my part, Bebeka Funded for Denmark, and Polskie Ministerstwo Nauki i Szkolnictwa Wyższego in Poland. All right, so the paper is on eye tracking measurement of cognitive load uh, using the wavelet transform and looking at the transient and uh, phasic, the phasic and tonic signals of the pupil diameter oscillation. So here we've got some applications where this could be used, automotive learning domains. This is a paper in 2016 at CHI. Uh, also, Pesakovic uh, did a PhD dissertation using uh, the low frequency, high frequency ratio of pupil diameter in his study. And some of our algorithmic development is based on that work. Uh, that was in Toulouse, France in 2016. And also another example is Friedman et al. 2018, also a Kai paper of uh, cognitive load during driving, among other examples, which you can look in the paper for more. I will skip most of this uh, just to mention the cognitive load theory uh, originated by Sweller in 88, uh, which highlighted the use and reliance on short-term memory, and which is why oftentimes uh, cognitive load is uh, measured using task difficulty tasks that use uh, some aspect of memory, such as NBAC. Oftentimes, eye tracking papers also mention Hess and Polk, 1964, referring back to that work on pupil diameter. However, it is very important to mention uh, that in that work, they used a specialized pupillometer, an Aeroflex 16 millimeter, which measured at two frames per second, which is very different from today's eye trackers, which measure at a higher rate and are usually much farther away from the pupil uh, and the eye is usually allowed to move. There is also something called the task evoked pupillary dilation or pupillary response to EPR that is often mentioned. And it's important to note here as per the graph in the original paper that pupil diameter is often measured in relation to a baseline measurement. So usually what happens is uh, there's a task where there's nothing happening and that's the baseline. And then a task of increased difficulty is given Pupil diameter is measured there, averaged, and then the difference is taken between that measurement and the average during baseline. Pesakovic in his study uh, linked pupil diameter to the LCNE system, where he basically said that the pupil diameter in response to task difficulty is the phasic response, uh, whereas the baseline measurement is linked to the tonic response. And one thing he also mentioned, uh, is that what if you take the measurement of the pupil under low light conditions? Well, in that case, the pupil diameter is already dilated and there's a danger there of missing uh, the uh, response to cognitive load uh, with pupil dilation as the expected response. So it's important to note that uh, for future studies. Uh, so basic coverage did a basic study uh, on a to lose end back task. I won't spend too much time on this because there are time constraints for this talk. The point being uh, though is that his ratio showed an inverse relationship to cognitive load. In other words, the LFHF ratio should be lower with an increased load. That's important to remember for later. And his response showed a uh, distinction between, uh, between this task difficulty. Uh, one thing to note about his uh, his task, though, is that uh, it was taken. The signal was taken over the entire duration of the uh, of the measurement. Whereas uh, what we do in the pupil uh, diameter and the wave of the transform can be measured uh, potentially in much shorter increments, perhaps even in real time. All right. So a lot of our work is based on our 2018 paper at CHI, where we introduced the IPA, which was the Index of Pupillary Activity based on Sandra Marshall's Index of Cognitive Activity, uh, something that she patented. Uh, but in her version of the ICA, there is only the uh, wavelet coefficient uh, 
decomposition mention and she does not mention the scaling function and because it is patented uh, details of her implementation are difficult to find outside of the patent itself so in 2018 we discussed how that works and we presented our own version of the uh, ICA called the IPA and so here similar to Sandra Marshall we have the wavelet decomposition the psi function but we also talked about the scaling function and both of them are used uh, in combination to give you the wavelet transform, which is important to note is a multi-resolution analysis of the signal. The J superscript there indicates which level of decomposition uh, you want to look uh, for the changes in the signal. So here is the discrete version and here's the wavelet uh, filtering. Essentially G there is the convolution of the filter you see in the table at left if we look down across the coefficients you see one and minus one and so it's a difference between successive pairs of numbers meanwhile the scaling function uses the h filter which is a uh, an averaging filter you see the coefficients there one and one divided by root two both of them so you have a sum uh, it's a sum of products so you take a first value is multiplied by one over root two the second value is one over root two add them together and divide and you get an average signal. Other filters can be used, of course. Uh, WSHE4 is a popular one. We end up using a Simlet 16 uh, wavelet. The longer the, the filter is, the smoother the effect is uh, of the scaling function. Here's an example of what you get in 2D. And so you have those same filters, but applied over the rows, in which case you get a difference and you get the vertical edges, as you see in quadrant two in the image at right. Or if you take the filters and apply them Per column, you will get horizontal edges, as you see in quadrant, uh, I believe it would be one, two, three, third quadrant, bottom left. Meanwhile, the scaling function gives you a subsampled version of the signal, which is at the upper left quadrant three. And if you now take the next level of the resolution, then we have the next level uh, coefficients. And so you can see that what we're getting is high frequency content at the original base of the pyramid, uh, and then we get lower frequency edges as we go up the pyramid in the uh, decomposition. In 1D, uh, the idea is similar, except of course it applies to the 1D signal, which is essentially what the pupil diameter is, it's just a line. So in practice, we use the Simlet 16 wave to get a slightly smoother signal. And what we did beyond Sandra Marshall's ICA is look at the edges or the changes in moment to moment oscillation of the pupil diameter. And that is accomplished by looking at the neighbors to the particular value that we're interested in. And if those neighbors are greater than or equal, uh, or sorry, the central value is greater than or equal to the neighbors, and it is strictly greater than one of them, then we have an edge in the signal. That's what we find to threshold uh, the moment-to-moment -moment oscillation of the pupil diameter. 2018 paper had the code for this, uh, which is still read readily available, of course. In 2020, we updated that uh, with the low frequency, high frequency ratio. Uh, and essentially what it is, is just taking uh, the low frequency component, uh, dividing it by the high frequency component. So the high frequency component is at the bottom of the pyramid, and you take something like in the middle uh, as the low frequency component, and then obtain the LF-HF ratio from within the wavelet uh, decomposition, which is, uh, I think new, I haven't seen anybody else do this. As I said, Pixar copies of this over the entire course of the signal. Here we're doing it within the wavelet domain. So that's our key technical innovation on the paper. All right, to validate, uh, we applied the LIPA, as it's called, the LHIPA, to uh, the same study that we did in 2018, which is a replication of Signal et al. Uh, and there it was number counting, so you either count backward by 17, the difficult task, or count forward by two. The easy task and you can see the paper for uh, the results that we obtained uh, two years ago uh, the study uh, was shown to be uh, uh, indeed indicative of, of the difficulty of the task so accuracy of responses were lower at high difficulty and it was also subjectively found to be annoying you can refer to that paper to get more details so the ipa then and now uh, responded directly uh, to the difficulty of the task. Uh, here, the LIPA, as, uh, as expected, is showing the inverse relationship. So the greater the difficulty, the lower the LIPA value. And so this is what we see. 
Neither can distinguish between easy and controlled tasks. However, that's not that necessarily bad, a bad result, because in a sense, not much is happening cognitively in the easy task. And so the distinction between those two and the control where nothing's happening uh, is, not such, is not so dire. All right, so the, really the innovations beyond the technical innovations, our paper introduces two additional tasks. In 2018, somebody in the audience said, well, did you use NBAC? And I said, no, because we had to replicate Siegenthaler et al. So here for 2020, we did do an, uh, an NBAC task following the uh, Apple et al. paper at ETRA 2018. Uh, it's a tubing in a uh, group, which did a one back and two back, or uh, at least that's what we asked them how they did theirs. And we asked for their guidance in how do we do the, uh, uh, the end back task here. And so we tried the four back task in a pilot study, but found that uh, remembering back four steps back actually led to uh, participants guessing in the pilot study. And so we got results that were no different from uh, random. So we ended up with one back as the easy task, which you just remember the letter before, and two back, you remember two letters before. And so this was uh, Nina's uh, contribution as design an experiment following uh, the Apple group. Uh, we used a limited alphabet, C, F, H, I think, and maybe S. I, you've referred back to the paper to see what, how we designed this task, uh, again, as a replication of uh, Apple et al's uh, ETRA paper. Uh, one problem we had in, the, in this setup is that, <clears throat> unfortunately, I used low lighting condition, and I guess I had forgotten about Pesakovich's warning that if you have the people already dilated, it might cause problems in finding people uh, difference related to that difference to the original baseline if you have low lighting condition. Nevertheless, we did do the one back and two back uh, tasks here, counterbalanced, and uh, LIPA showed, as expected, a good response, whereas the task was distinguished from baseline. The IPA, on the other hand, uh, responded contrary to expectations. In fact, it decreased with task difficulty, which is not good. One other thing that I, we did here was we varied the gaze point to five different locations of the screen uh, to control for that, whereas the original IPA in 2018 used a fixed gaze task where people looked only in the center of the screen. So here we were controlling for the apparent, uh, appearance, appearance of the pupil off axis, which will be an ellipse when it's off axis to the camera in the eye tracker. And that had no effect, so that's a good thing. Uh, here in experiment three was our applied setting where people were performing an eye typing task. Again, uh, two difficulty levels measured by the Lix readability score. They had to remember a phrase and then type it back in an eye typing kind of application as shown here. If the LIX was less than 30, was less than 30 was the easy task, greater than 60 was a difficult task. Uh, here you can see the letter T highlighted in red, which is what the user is fixating to type the letter T. And in this case, once again, LIPA showed uh, results that uh, were consistent with the other experiments. In other words, LIPA is inversely proportional to task difficulty, which is a good thing. IPA, once again, uh, gave us uh, results contrary to expectations. One thing to note here, uh, eye gaze is free to move as the person is typing. And so this is a very good, robust uh, result of the LIPA uh, in this particular uh, example. So that's it, we've got three experiments. So it looks like we have pretty good, robust results for LIPA. The IP, on the other hand, uh, only used one uh, wavelet coefficient band. It did not take into account the tonic phasic relate, um, ratio as the LIPA does, and that is probably the reason why LIPA is responding better uh, in, in these three tasks, whereas the IPA only responded well in the original fixed gaze task. So it looks like it has a pretty good potential for uh, being ro a robust measure of cognitive load, as well as for potential real-time use. Thank you very much. Um, because it's a limited kind of, or virtual conference, I suppose, the best way I can entertain, entertain questions might be through email, and I'll be happy to do so. I'm happy to share the code uh, in Python if you like as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'm eager to see how LIPA would, uh, how would work in your experiments. So if you are interested in this, please do let me know, and I look forward to getting in touch. Thank you very much.